So today is Pentecost Sunday, um, and I'm going to start, we're going to have a look at why we celebrate Pentecost and what that is, um, but we will also learn today what we should have learned a few weeks ago um, when I was supposed to preach on the Holy Spirit when we were in our foundation series, and so I don't know what you remember about that, but that was the day that the Holy Spirit decided that we weren't going to have a preach, we were just going to have the Holy Spirit. So, um, so I'm bringing it in defiance. No, I'm not bringing it in defiance. <laughs> I'm bringing it because it's some important stuff that it's really good to know um, what we as a Rise Church state as our belief about the Holy Spirit. So I believe that the Holy Spirit um, is essential for Christian life. He is, he is essential for, uh, he plays an essential role in our change, our transformation, um, in our fruitfulness, um, and also in our mission as well. And, and there's some essential spiritual knowledge coming here this morning, guys. Um, stuff that every Christian know, needs to know in order to be equipped so that they can change, so that they are transformed, and so that they're empowered to live a spirit-filled life. Because, you know, if we don't have a spirit-filled life, then we still have a worldly-filled life. Because if the spirit is not living within us, then we will be pulled away and we will be um, influenced by the world and the culture that is around us. We have to fill that space in us with the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, all sorts of other things will come in and try and take up that space. So, some foundational truths this morning about being set free from all of that baggage and issues that we continually carry around with us, because we all do. I've got issues, I've got baggage that I carry around with me. I'm very aware that there are, there are things that I interpret according to the baggage and stuff, and the, we call them the shadow, maybe, that I carry around with me. Hurts from the past that, it, that um, then impose themselves on decisions that I make, on people, you know, on, on my relationships with people. So the only way to discard all of that is to have the Holy Spirit deal with all of those baggage, that baggage. We're not going to be perfect this side of heaven, but we can cast all of that care and anxiety on him so that we can live a spirit-filled life. So we're going to start by reading Acts 2, and I know we've had it already twice this morning, so we've had it in the 9.30, and we had a little bit of it um, at the beginning um, when Pete read some of it, but it really is such a brilliant scripture. I'm going to read it again now. So, if we could get it up on the slide, I think we've got, we should have Acts 2, yeah. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to, hit to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want you to really un understand how immense this act was okay so this wasn't a warm feeling or a bit of a rosy glow okay these guys had never experienced this before they did not know what they were waiting for Jesus had literally just said to them go and wait in Jerusalem for power from on high so they didn't know what that looked like what it felt like um, and so the, this, this first pouring out of the Spirit had to be spectacular. It had to be so that the disciples knew that this was it. And that the people watching on also knew that this was it. There wasn't going to be any conversations later about, well, maybe it was just, you know, a bit of hype. Or maybe it was just excitement. Or, you know, maybe it wasn't real. Maybe they were just uh, uh, making it up. Absolutely not. This had this because those are some of the things that are said today when the Holy Spirit is poured out. Okay, and so this had to be absolute evidence that this was God. And so there were physical tongues of fire on their on their head, and there were tongues coming from their mouths, languages of that they had never earned, learned even. 
Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. You see, so even there, you get them mocking. Oh, they're just drunk. They're drunk. But all of these languages that were being spoken, you see, Pentecost was a harvest festival. And um, so what happened was, by that time, the Jews were dispersed across the the, the known world. And we call that the Jewish diaspora. Okay, so Jews from Jerusalem had gone out into the known world and were living right across the known world, the Roman world at that time. But for Pentecost, they would have come back to Jerusalem to celebrate with family that was still there. So there would have been about over a million Jews in Pentecost, in, at Pentecost in Jerusalem at that time. And so who knows how many languages that they had learned. Now, remember, these Jews, they all would have still spoken Aramaic, which was their, their native tongue. They would have known Hebrew from the scriptures. They would have, if they ever, ever, ever wanted to trade with anyone, they would have had to have spoken Greek. Greek and if they were under Roman occupation they would have spoken Latin as well so God could have used any of those languages to 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 communicate with them if it was just a message that he wanted to give but no what he does is he brings the languages from their native lands that they have learned and he and he the disciples speak in these languages because if they'd have spoken in Greek or Latin or Aramaic or Hebrew, they'd have just gone, oh, yeah, no, oh, okay, that's God speaking, perhaps. But the, the miracle, the wonder of those men speaking in languages that they had never, ever learned, that was spectacular. That was a huge move of God. So this is why Pentecost is so, so significant. Because what happens then is, and we're going to go into what Peter did in a minute, but what happens is after they get saved, they then all go back to their native lands, to the lands that they were living in, and they begin to tell the story of what has happened in Jerusalem. And so that is why it's called the birth of the Christian church, because it's from that point that it began to just build and build and build across the Roman world. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. That's nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And so then Peter gets up, and he, he tells them that this is that age. This is what they've been waiting for. The age where the Spirit will be poured out for all people, all believers, to be baptized in, to be filled with. So the Holy Spirit had, had worked throughout Um, the Old Testament and times before, he wasn't like a secret that nobody knew about, and we'll come to that in a moment, but he only acted in particular ways. So he would come upon a particular person for a particular um, uh, thing that needed doing. So he came upon Bezalel to put the the jewelry and the gold on the Ark of of the Covenant. Um, He came upon uh, Mary for her pregnancy, came upon Simeon, a Simeon... um, 
prophesied over the baby Jesus. So right up and t- all the way through, the Holy Spirit would come upon someone, Samson, when he was taken prisoner and he had all his hair cut off. And then he was put between the pillars in the Philistine temple and the Holy Spirit filled him and he knocked down the temple. It was the, the Holy Spirit didn't remain with anyone. He came upon people for particular purposes at particular times, particular people, but he didn't remain with them and this is now a different age and Peter is explaining that he's saying this is the age that the Joel that Joel the prophet prophesied that the Holy Spirit will be poured poured out on all flesh and sons and daughters will prophesy and young men will see visions and old men will dream dreams and even servants um, will have the spirit poured out upon them and so that's one of the things that we've been looking at As we have been looking at our gifted series just recently, we've been looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are available when the Spirit is poured out, when somebody becomes baptized in the Spirit. So the Spirit works in many different ways in our lives. And I think we've... um, We've, we've said this throughout the Gifted series, that you know the first thing he does is he convicts us of our sin. Okay, so the first thing the Holy Spirit does is he's the one that prompted our hearts when we first began to come into contact with God or with church or with Christians, and he's the one that made us go, oh, I've, really, I've not really had a very good life, and I, I, I can see that there's something better. I, I, I need to explore about God. I need to find out who this Jesus is. That's the Holy Spirit convicting you. And then he works in regeneration. So as we become a Christian, as that conversion is made from death to life, which we've just celebrated out there in the water, a brilliant demonstration because, honestly, if we'd have held um, Jamie and Jaden under the water, they would have died. Okay, so death to life, we allow them to come back up, up again, they're raised to, sorry, Jamie and Jaden here, I didn't mean to, <laughs> we weren't going to do that at any point, we didn't talk about that as a leadership team, I promise you, but that's the, that's the, the example of death to life, and so the Holy Spirit does that regeneration, he, um, he makes us that new person, the old has gone, the new has come, and he changes us even as we have been saved. So even without being filled by the Spirit, he changes us. You will see fruit of the Spirit in people that have become Christians. The fruit, um, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, something else, self-control. Which one did I Goodness, I forgot goodness. Goodness, goodness me, I forgot goodness. Um, So you'll see the Holy Spirit changing people, and those are the fruit that you'll see. Those are the things that you will see. Um, But the empowering work of the Holy Spirit comes when we are baptized in the Spirit. There is a subsequent act where the Spirit comes upon us and and really fills us. We We call it being baptized in the Spirit, and that empowers us for work and service for God. And he also equips us, as we've seen again in our gifted series, there's gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given, that are talked about in 1 Corinthians 12, that allows us to use those to build one another up and build up the body of Christ. And then there is an ongoing relationship with the Holy Spirit. So this is not a one-off act. This is not like water baptism where you do it and then you don't do it again. Baptism in the Holy Spirit should take place as often as you want it to and need it to and require it to. So for me, that's every single morning. The first thing I say every single morning, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit today. Because I have to start my day there. I have to start my day there. I can't, I can't wait till something goes wrong and then say, oh, oh Lord, I forgot. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. I need some power for this. I have to start my day with being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then I know, I have confidence then, that no matter how I feel, and believe me, today I am shattered, I'm really tired today, but I know that that doesn't matter because my strength is not what this is all about. It's his strength and it's his empowerment and that's what comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. So here at Arise Church, we have some very distinct views 
and beliefs on the Holy Spirit, and we reflect this in our statement of faith. And this is what I was supposed to preach on a few weeks ago, um, but we were taken over by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I do want to bring some of that to you today, um, because I think it's really important to know the biblical nature of what we're talking about now. It's not enough to just go, oh yeah, we're filled with the Spirit because that's what Christians do. Okay, It has to be biblical. It, everything has to be rooted in Scripture. And I say that to you as an Ephesians 4.11 teacher. It's like the most important thing to me that anything, any action, any overflow, any act, anything is rooted in scripture because it's so easy 2,000 years after Christ to go, oh, well, that's what the church does. So we just do it. No, 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 that's not right. And even things like women in leadership, for me, women being included in leadership and teaching and preaching is not because it's cultural now and it wasn't cultural then. It can't be just because women are seen differently now than they were in the Bible times. It has to already be rooted in scripture. And I'm not going to do it this morning, but if you want to sit down with me and go through the scriptures that tell us that I am perfectly able to stand here and teach you, I will be happy to do it over coffee. We have done it in the past, okay? We have preached on it in the past, but it's not. We do not include women here because that's what culture does today. We do it because it's what Jesus always meant to happen. And actually, it was the patriarchal society that dismissed us, not God and not Jesus. Girl power. <laughs> I got a clap then. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, girl power is not in scripture. <laughs> that was the Spice Girls. Just saying. Okay. So, here is our statement of faith about the Holy Spirit. We say this. We say, we believe in the deity of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. He is sent by the Father and the Son. He is present in all true believers. He convicts of sin. He regenerates the sinner. He assures the believer of salvation. He brings true understanding to the scriptures and acts as advocate and guide. And we believe in the subsequent act of baptism in the Holy Spirit and that he gives gifts to God's people, 1 Corinthians 12, to empower and edify the body of Christ. So let's break this down. And I'm going to skim through this because I really don't want this to be all that this morning is about. So we first of all believe in the deity of the Holy Spirit. That means that we believe the Holy Spirit is God. Okay, so Dei, D-E-I, is the Latin name for God. So when you hear the word deity used, it's referring to God. It's the same as the word divinity, okay? So this is God. So we believe that the Holy Spirit is God. Why do we believe the Holy Spirit is God? Well, he has the attributes of God. <coughs> and when we look in the Bible, we see that he has the attributes of God. So first of all, he is the creator. Genesis 1-2 tells us that the earth was formless and empty. You're going to have to keep up with me, um, <laughs> Nehemiah. Good. Because okay. there are quite a few, but they're all really short. So you're just going to have to listen and keep up. So the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit, the word used there is ruach in the Hebrew, of God was hovering over the waters. Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Same word, ruach. So ruach can be translated spirit or breath or wind, but it's the same word. It shows us that the spirit was there at creation. Psalm 104, 30 says, when you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. And Job 34, 4, the spirit. The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. So he is creator. He is also omnipresent. Omnipresent means that he is present all over the place at all times. So you don't get the Holy Spirit in Lincoln, and so poor old Doncaster have to go out with, go without it this morning because he's in Lincoln and he's busy. Okay, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He can be in all places at all times. Psalm 139 verses 7 to 10 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. 
If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. So, his creator, his omnipresent. He is also transformer. And this is fully um, developed in the New Testament, but it's also in the Old Testament. In Ezekiel 36... God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So the Holy Spirit transforms people. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, he is a transformer. We also believe that he is the third person of the Trinity, and that's the second statement in the foundation of faith. So, we can see this very easily. The creation story, I've just shown you that the, um, that the Holy Spirit was there. Well, John 1 also tells us that Jesus was there because John 1, calling Jesus the Logos, which um, is, is a word that's difficult to explain right from the front, but it basically is a word that is used to refer to, uh, culturally refer to, um, wisdom and philosophy. So a little bit like we might say today, what is the meaning of life? The, the Greeks and the Epicureans back then were saying, what is the Logos? Who is the Logos? Well, you know, where is the Logos? And John meets that with Jesus is the Logos. Okay, So in the beginning was the Logos, the Word. And the Word was with God and he was God. And he was with God in the beginning. And nothing was created, nothing that has been created was created without him. So Jesus was at creation. So we know the Father was there, we know the Spirit was there, and we know that Jesus was there. So that's the Trinity. And the only other place where we see the Trinity all in the same place together is at the baptism of Jesus. So you've got Jesus, the second part of the Trinity, stood in the water being baptized. The Father, the first part of the Trinity, speaking from heaven, this is my Son, with you I'm well pleased. In fact, you are my son, with you I'm well pleased. And the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove and remains bodily with Jesus. So again, all three members of the Trinity in the same place. So we believe that the, th that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He is also sent by the Father and the Son. Okay, so it's not so the Father sent Jesus, the Father and Jesus sent the Spirit. In John 14, verse 26, it says, The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Now, John is the only writer to pers personify the Holy Spirit or personalize the Holy Spirit. He gives him a name, paraclete, or in the Greek, parakletos. And the only other place that this word is used to describe someone is when John also uses it to describe Jesus. So Jesus is the parakletos, and the Holy Spirit is another parakletos. And he's another one of the same kind of the one that was before. So he's another one just like Jesus. So he really is Jesus' replacement when Jesus had to go back. And you actually see that in, in John when Jesus says to the disciples, I have to go. I have to leave you. Because if I don't, then the Holy Spirit can't come. And if he can't come, you know, then the, the whole of time is changed, really, because the age of the Spirit has to be ushered in, which is what we're in now. And so he, he personifies, he, or he per, personalizes the Holy Spirit. He calls him paraclete. He, um, he matches all his attributes to Jesus' attributes. And it's very, very clear from John's message across his gospel and his epistles that the Holy Spirit is a second Jesus. It really, really is. So much so, in fact, that you have to look through 
the, John's Gospel and find the bits where he's saying Jesus is still going to come because there have been thoughts in the past that John is actually saying that there won't be any co second coming of Christ because the Holy Spirit is the second coming of Christ. He's the Spirit of Jesus and that is him come back. That's not true. That is heresy. Okay, so don't, do not tell anyone that I taught you that. So great, isn't it? I say things, you hear what I don't hear. We, we once had a great um, example of that. My principal was speaking in, um, my le in one of our uh, lectures at Bible College, and he was talking about the thief on the cross. And he was saying, you know, that it shows that, you know, you just have to accept Jesus even in the last minutes of life, blah, blah, blah. And then he went, but be careful, because you cannot make a theology out of one man who died on a cross. And we were all like, uh, think you can. <laughs> think you can. Anyway, we had great fun the next week putting that phrase in the college newspaper. Principal says, can't make a theology over one man dying on a cross. So yeah, you have to listen to the context. See guys, this is why context is always really, really important. So yeah. So Paul's letter to the, to, the, to the Galatians says that Christ lives in us. When he says, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I have lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He is talking about the spirit of Christ. Obviously, the person of Christ does not live in us. You know, there's not a little man inside us, sat on our heart, telling us what to do, okay? It is the Spirit of Christ that is being referred to, and the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit. He tells us that we receive the Holy Spirit by faith, and it is his presence that gives us hope of righteousness. So we cannot be righteous on our own. We can't do it, okay? We cannot be right all the time. And I know that that might come to some of us as a real hurt this morning because I love being right, okay? But I, even I have had to find out that I can't be right all the time, okay? We cannot be righteous. We cannot get it right all the time. We cannot be that perfect person in our own strength. But with the Holy Spirit, he gives us the hope of righteousness because through him, we can attain all sorts of things that we can't attain in our own strength. And so we have the hope of not only being a little bit more righteous here, but being fully righteous at, um, et in eternity. And also when God looks at us, he sees the spirit of Christ. He sees the blood of Jesus. He sees our righteousness. Um, the, the righteous um, version of us. So there it is, all wrapped up in, in the Holy Spirit, the hope of righteousness. Paul says that we need to walk by the Spirit so we don't give in to the desires of the flesh. He teaches that there is a constant battle between the Spirit and the sinful nature. Oh, notes have just frozen. Where are we? Yep, constant battle between the spirit and sinful nature. There are works of the flesh, so the things that we do that are, that, are, that are sinful, and the fruit of the spirit, which I've already mentioned. And we will only overcome sin, the works of the flesh, by walking in the spirit. If we sow into our sinful nature, then we will reap more sin. If we sow into the spirit, we will reap more eternal life. Paul's development of the role of the Holy Spirit continues in Romans, where he said that those that are in Christ, that's filled with the Holy Spirit, are the ones that walk by the Spirit. So his only reference before chapter 8 is to tell us how the love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So the other thing that we, um, that we believe, and it's in our statement of faith, is that um, the Holy Spirit um, convicts of sin and regenerates the sinner. And again, John's gospel, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. He does so much. Titus says he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. 
He brings true understanding of the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 2 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And he acts as our advocate and guide, and we believe in the subsequent act. So Pete already explained this about how when we are saved, the Holy Spirit does one work in us. He regenerates us. Then there is a subsequent act. Now, the reason we're saying subsequent and not secondary is because it can actually all happen at the same time. So if you are praying for someone and leading them to Christ, if I'm praying for someone and leading them to Christ, I will pray that they become a Christian, they, they acknowledge that, and then I will immediately pray that they are filled with the Holy Spirit. So it can happen at salvation, but it won't naturally happen. It is a subsequent act. It is an act where you have to say, this is what I want, and so the Holy Spirit will fill you. Because he won't force himself on any of us, you know. He really won't. He convicts us of sin. He leads us to a place where we know we need Jesus. And then when we make the decision to accept Jesus, it is the Holy Spirit who regenerates us, makes us a new creation, gives us a new start. And that regeneration, that new start is ours, whether we progress further with the work of the Spirit or not. But in order to live that regenerated life to its full, To gain full freedom that salvation in Jesus brings us, we must be baptised in the Holy Spirit in order to continue. If not, we will be swayed by worldly teaching and will be confused by conspiracy theories. We'll be tempted into sin. We will slowly lose our way. And I'm convinced that those Christians who do lose their way, and, and, and I know plenty of people like this that were once really on fire for God, and now you look at them and you go, well, were they ever a Christian? What, what happened there, God? You know, is it that they were and they've fallen away? Or is it that that was all, you know, that wasn't real in the first place? We don't know. Well, for me, I believe that they haven't had good teaching on being baptized in the Spirit. They haven't become baptized in the Spirit. They haven't been filled with the Spirit. They haven't been empowered. They haven't been taught how to live a life of discipleship empowered by the Spirit. And so people fall away. So we are called to bring biblical truth and, li- and, and w- love to the world. We're called to live differently to show who Jesus is. And we can't do that without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 6 says, For to set the mind on flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So in order to fully partner with the Spirit... There's a couple of things that we need to know. And this has already been mentioned this morning by Felix, actually. The Holy Spirit must be received. It is not a passive act. You're not going to get it just coming to church on a Sunday morning and sitting in a seat and hoping it's going to happen. Okay? It has to be received. And you're also not going to get it if you come to the front and be prayed, but you're like, I really don't want this. You, You have to receive the Holy Spirit. John 20, 22 says, when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Peter and John, Acts 8, came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit? The word in the Greek is lambano, and it means to take hold of, to literally reach out and grasp, okay? So that's what we have to do to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This cannot be a passive experience. God does not dominate us. He wants relationship, not domination, and he will never force himself upon us. And just like salvation, there is a decision that the believer needs to make in order to receive the Holy Spirit. We need to be thirsty for this, we need to be ready to take hold of this, and we need to be prepared to release the outflow of this as well. John 7, 37-39 says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart 
will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. He hadn't been um, crucified, resurrected and returned to heaven. So once again, we receive the Holy Spirit, we grasp it, we, we, we receive it, we reach out, we take it, we are open to it, we open our hearts. Sometimes I say to people when I'm praying for them, I just want you to imagine your heart and I want you to imagine there's two doors on it and right now I want you to fling them open. And, and wait for the Holy Spirit to enter. Now, that's a nice little thing to say, but actually, it's not the heart, as we know it, where the Holy Spirit lives. The Bible actually talks about the gut. When the Bible talks about the heart, the word is actually the gut. Okay, It's that place. You know that place, I think I've said this before, where you feel emotion, where you feel loss. You know when somebody near you has gone or died or something and you wake up in the morning and then you suddenly remember that they're not here anymore and you feel that loss here in the gut that gut feeling that we talk about that don't we We say that gut feeling it's the place where you feel your deepest emotions it's the place where you feel embarrassment you know something's happened and shown you up in public and and you oh you're like oh It's right here. You all know what I'm talking about, that gut feeling. The Greek talks about a concave place. And it is clear that God has given us a place where the Holy Spirit belongs within our physical bodies. Right from creation, we were made with a hollow space that can only be filled by the Spirit of God. Many try and fill it with other things. Money, career, parties, sex, drugs. None of that will suffice. Only the Spirit of God, given as an exchange for your sinful nature at salvation, only that can fill the space to completion. And it is our responsibility to not only receive that infilling, but to keep it filled. Every day, every morning, every single day of our lives. To keep in step with him, to live the life he has called us to, and to experience the freedom and abundant life that Jesus brings. And in a minute, we're going to open up the front here and we're going to pray for people. If the um, worship team want to come back, that would be great. (coughs) So we receive the Holy Spirit and we are empowered by that Holy Spirit, but we must also... Be the, have the rivers of living water flowing from us. So we don't receive it and keep it. That empowerment has to empower us to live a Christian life that gives witness to who Jesus is. Okay, and the, the empowerment that we have means that we can do those things that we might find difficult to do. So Peter, a very lowly fisherman who couldn't even read and write, stood up and preached to 3,000 people and 3,000 people got saved. He probably preached to more than 3,000, but 3,000 people got saved. That's not something that he would have said he was skilled at. It gives us the power to be Christians in our workplace. It gives us the power to be Christians at school. It gives us the power to say, no, I'm sorry, I won't come and see that film with you. It it's, it's doesn't fit in with where I stand in the world. Or, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go out and get drunk at the nightclubs. I'll come with you, I'll dance, but you know, I'm not going to... I'm not going to power through the shots and be absolutely legless. It gives you power to live your life. Maybe you do power through the shots. I could, I could feel like a tumbleweed go across when I said that. So, okay, if you want some shots, drink some shots. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I didn't say you couldn't. So, being baptised in the Spirit opens us up to those spiritual gifts, which we've just talked about in our Gifted series, if you just want to... Tinkle, Um, opens up with gifts and he convicts, regenerates and empowers us. And we should come to church on a Sunday ready to empower others with those gifts. So in a minute we're going to open this up for you to receive 
but you receive and give out. You receive and use. You don't receive and keep that for yourself. So when God's people come together, we shouldn't come here to receive. We should come to pour out that Holy Spirit that we are filled with on each other. And last night, we had the prophetic conference here yesterday. I wasn't actually here last night, but even during the day, I saw people receiving and giving that Holy Spirit, receiving and stepping into prophesying, receiving and stepping into speaking in tongues. It was a great day and the thirst for ministry apparently last night was incredible, amazing. People just wanted more of the Holy Spirit. So that's amazing, that's great, but it has to be poured out as well. It has to be poured out of you. And some things you will do just out of the overflow of the Holy Spirit in you. So you have to be filled in order for there to be an overflow. You can't do this. We can't minister to each other. We can't be church. We can't be the body of Christ to each other without the Holy Spirit. We can't do it in our own strength. It has to be in His. The Holy Spirit is God's great equaliser. It doesn't matter if you don't have a theology degree or if you're not on the preaching team. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, we all have something to contribute and pour out to each other. It's how we can love when we don't agree with each other. It's how we can encourage when we don't understand someone's situation. It's how we can pray when we don't know the answer. No natural ability is needed, just the supernatural power of God who then fills you every morning and then is poured out to others and we all operate out of that strength. It doesn't matter that we're not all leaders. It doesn't matter that we've not all got powerful careers. It doesn't matter what we have attained in our own strength. What matters is we're filled with the Holy Spirit and that Spirit is outpoured from us living in the world, showing who Jesus is, looking after people, love and compassion and empathy and showing them who Jesus really, really is. And as Paul says, love one another and desire spiritual gifts. That love has to come first. If you are being filled with the Holy Spirit and you do not exercise that in love, that's not how God intended it to be. In fact, being filled with the Holy Spirit gives you a love for the world. Not for the things they do, but for the people. You begin to see how the people are so trapped. And, and so they're just, they're just so um, empowered by their own culture, empowered by their own world. I, I used to grieve my heart in school when I would just hear children, teenagers being so mean to each other. So mean, saying things over each other's lives that I knew were going to affect them for the rest of their lives. Where's the kindness in the world? Where's the love? There isn't much. And so we are charged with that purpose. To be filled with the Spirit, to be filled with love, and to go out into the world and witness as, for Christ. Christ. 